our periodization and periodization for people is they should understand where their base is and then and then where their tail end is, where they want to be in whatever, six months, 12 months or whatever, and work their way back backwards from that. Welcome to another episode of Wits and Weights. George Sheehan, a legend of running and running literature, wrote the following. Why race? The need to be tested, perhaps. The need to take risks and the chance to be number one. Today's guest has encountered every reason to not race. From abandonment to abuse, family deceptions, untimely deaths, drugs, and alcohol, professional athlete Stephen Benedict was confronted with more obstacles before the age of 28 than the majority of people face in a lifetime. Despite these hardships, Stephen applied what he learned on the track to remain focused on the finish line. His rules for running the race translate to almost every industry, person, and circumstance, and his story is a reminder to all who hear it that so long as you still have breath in your lungs, your race can still be won. Stephen, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, I look forward to talking today, and thanks for the intro. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a great it's a great intro. So high expectations, uh, and the audience does want to get to know you a bit better before we dive into the specific topic today, which is going to be periodization. But let's start with your background as a professional athlete, as it pertains to running the race, to optimizing performance. And then if you want to tie it into training principles like periodization, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So my background as an athlete, uh, I started running, actually, I got pushed into running when I was a freshman year in high school. And uh, um, I was on the football field. Football was pretty dominant for my life, as well as some other sports early on. My first sport ever being martial arts. I did 10 years of judo. And that kind of laid the discipline and the foundational aspects of being able to translate into other sports uh, at a high level. But like I said, uh, the, the track and field coach saw me on the football field when I was a freshman, approached my parents. My parents you know, wanted me to try something different and something new and it really wasn't on my radar. And so reluctantly, I jumped in there for my winter season and wound up wound up winning the uh, county championships as a freshman. And it just kind of built up over time. And I really honed in and liked the aspect in the sport that is a one-on-one sport. It's pretty much you against the clock and whatever you put into it, you get back mm-hmm. from it. You know, obviously, you know, it's a lot different from, let's say, baseball, football, basketball, um, whereas these team reliance sports, you know, here it's you know, you running your race, you are in your lane. Of course, there's other athletes that are on the track with you, but you're really focusing on what your race model is compared to the other athletes. And if you lose that focus and you start running their race, automatically you're putting yourself in the red already. So, um that's kind of like the early on stages. And I was able to run in some of the world's uh, most prestigious races across the board from Penn Relays uh, while I was in high school to States and international races uh, to Diamond League meets and um, and then go on to things like uh, Olympic trials and, um, you know, and then uh, the bigger platform. So it's been a big roller coaster, you know, obviously with not only of my athletic career, but then also my story background, um, which was, you know, all over the place of things. People see it as well. He's an athlete. He's got it all together. And that was far from it. Um, so I got a lot of loss and a lot of abandonment, you know, growing up through the foster care system and then losing my adopted parents. So there's been quite a bit uh, that have taught me not only through my sports, but also in life. Uh, about resiliency and patience and due diligence and really just focusing and keeping my eye on the prize and, um, you know, keeping good people around me, coaches. And, um, you know, to my current position today where I'm at the tail end of my career and training for my last Olympic Games, which will be Paris. And um, and then I'll shift into uh, and move into something else that will be in correlation to all the knowledge and the hours and, uh, you know, the training aspects that I have been able to put in in this time and try to benefit and bring value to other people's lives. Awesome. So there, there's a lot there. There's definitely a lot of uh, paths we can take. What, what, one of the things that sticks out is me is the parallels that you talk about between 
um, the, the, the discipline and the practice and the, the way that you approach specifically that, uh, sport of running in that you're really racing against yourself. You're competing against yourself, even though you compete against others at some point, um, you can't focus on that. It actually reminded me of lifting in a way, right? Cause I don't know much about running. Never have. I tried running when I was younger. It's just not, not my thing, but I think we can learn a lot from the sport and what you said of like, if you were a power lifter or a lifter, you can't focus on what other people's numbers because it's really irrelevant to your own performance. So maybe we get into that a little bit more and talk about performance and then talk about periodization as a model for doing that because I think there's a, a lot of relevance there. Um, do we want to start with you know what you mean by periodization maybe and why athletes or lifestyle trainees would use it? Yeah, I think, you know, well, first and foremost, periodization is very relevant to the period in which you are in your life and how that translates to your, your, whether it be lifting or your, your specific kind of goal setting or specific kind of movement or modalities that you're doing, you know, whether it be lifting, whether it be running, whether it be, you know, on the field playing soccer, um, you know, we only see, so me putting myself on the chopping block is, uh, we only see for us, you know, since track and field is not as marketed in this, in the States, you only really see like the world championships where you see the Olympics, uh, every four years, every two and a half years, something like that, depending on uh, the, the big meets, you don't see what goes on behind and you don't really see all of the constant due diligence that these athletes are putting in and the coaches in order to have our peak at Mm -hmm. those games, but also at the championship store. So, you know, so in specific for me, like, you know, September, usually September we start and it's just base work, you know, it's just really putting our body back into movement flow and, and learning how to run again and, you know, kind of, kind of trying to pick up where our previous season ended and implement that early in the season so that we're kind of moving forward. We're not starting back two years. You know, we're starting where we left off after our break. So we have the rest. We have that whole aspect of recovery, um, that downtime, that disconnect, and then we plug back in, um, kind of recharging our batteries. But, you know, our periodization and periodization for people is they should understand where their base is and then, and then where their tail end is where they want to be in whatever, six months, 12 months or whatever, and work their way back backwards from that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to ask about that. You know, it it seemed like you want to reverse engineer from an event or a peak. I mean, we do that with nutritional periodization as well, right? You have a goal Mm -hmm. and you work back from there, whether it's lose weight or build muscle, whatever. Um, so what about, um, how do, how does specificity and adaptation play into that, right? Into how you periodize someone's programming or that, that phase, knowing that you have this, the skill that you have to develop, but you also have other things that support that like strength, power, speed, and so on. Yeah, of course. Um, first, first and foremost, foundational aspects, you know, if we left off on a good note or we're going in and they're coming in from scratch, one, I need to know what their predisposed situations were, any of their, if they have any ailments or anything like that, any previous injuries or surgeries or anything like that has been chronic or ongoing so that we can really address those because they probably haven't gone away. They're probably just hibernating right now until things start to build up and we start adding on weight or we start pushing the pace on things or anything like that. So, um, is that what I have a hibernating shoulder? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I have. Exactly. That's the word. Okay. Okay. Shoulder. Well, hibernating shoulder. I've had, you know, hibernating Achilles. I've had, uh, you <laughs> know, sure you hamstring <laughs> issues. Um, and it wasn't really until I stepped back and really addressed those things and be like, okay, well, this has been chronic and it's been going on for look like, let's say, I'm good through the beginning phases of my training where the foundational aspect is great. And then I move on into kind of like the strength and power development. But when I get into speed stuff, that's when things start to kind of show up, right? And that's when the, the post kind of wear and tear of things show up. But um, as for other people, it's just kind of the same thing as, as we push the needle, mm-hmm. things start to show up and, and your body 
starts to show its kind of true colors, right? It starts to become transparent and transparency with clients. And, and also when I work with anybody is super vital. Like, you know, I don't need you to be a superstar. You're not trying to impress me. I've already performed at a high level. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, there's no kind of ego aspect here. Um, But, you know, in that space is understanding foundation, understanding patience, understanding the little things of accumulation into the bigger things, like uh, movement correction and understanding like, so for runners, it's, it's a lot of feet issues that contribute to going up the the uh, the the chain of things through their knees, through the hamstrings, through their hips, all the way up through their scapula and stuff. So, and I think a lot of runners don't understand that as like, you know, we start from the bottom of the foundation and work up, not where the point of kind of um, hurting or the kind of um, you know debilitation is. So, you know, there's a lot of writing down notes, notes taking and building relationship and rapport with people, um, whether, you know, they're the athlete or the weekend warrior or anything, understanding that at the beginning, like this is a long-term gain, just as you said, um, is a long-term gain and understanding that each phase is a phase for the coinciding phases to come. Mm, All right. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, part of the periodization thing and the foundational piece is, super important uh for for any athlete you know i mean for track and field athletes it's it's vital if our if our if our preseason is terrible it's going to show up come around march march ish Mm -hmm. you know when we start getting into spikes and we start pushing and start pushing the paces a bit you know if we haven't done the rehab stuff and the the foundational strength stuff uh we're going to blow a wheel so to say so so in this, in this preseason, is there, I mean, a lot of what you're telling me sounds like definitely if you had a coach, they're going to be able to individualize and understand these subtleties with you and bring their fresh pair of eyes and expertise to it. Uh, but even if somebody wanted to do this on their own, who's maybe it's the first time and they're not at that elite level, mm-hmm. um, is there a, is there a model that, that we follow in the preseason of a certain stacked level of, of things to focus on? Like, okay, take take two or three weeks and and go through this checklist and make sure you can get out of it here, you know, at this level of health or performance. And then that tells you you're ready to go to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Can it be simplified to that level? Like, Hey, maybe you can write a book about it. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think in, in layman's terms in a simple way is, you know, quantity to quality, Mm -hmm. um, type of mind frame. Uh, yes. You know, there's a lot of volume early on, but it's not, it's, it's progressive volume. It's not a let's dump the dump truck on you all all in one phase and then then you're worth nothing uh, come the next month or the next you know the next four weeks after the first four weeks. <clears throat> um, as far as program design and kind of progression in that one foundational strength and um, and then strength endurance, strength of power, and then you know quality, which is whether it be speed reps or anything on that sense. So there's like kind of like four building blocks there, dependable um, on the over encompassing um, goal or the, the athlete in or the subject in question. But, uh, you know, overall wise, you know, it's, it's really a foundational piece and building out the the spaces of you know like those blocks and and not rushing those blocks they could be for one person they, that block could be four weeks another person it could be six to eight weeks you know depending on their learning curve and you know how much they really need to know um i am usually in the six to eight week span of people mm-hmm. to give them the time and and to give them that adaptation period of their body to understand movement uh okay. and then you know, in the beginning, I recommend somebody to have somebody alongside them at all times, or at least accountability wise, if they're new to the space, just so they can learn, right? It's like going to school. Um, For me, my coaches are invaluable, right? I need the eyes on me, because I can't see myself run. But I'm very good at making adjustments with cues given to me. 
And that becomes body awareness and that becomes, you know, conversational aspects of understanding, you know, how the coach can relate to their athlete and how they can translate what the coach is telling them into movement or mindset, the kind of the, the brain body connectivity aspect of things. Yeah. And I think that's important what you're saying to people listening. Cause I hear a lot of the time, you know, I'll, I'll get a coach when I need it or when I need to fix something or whatever. And you're, and you're like, just get the coach from the beginning because you're going to cut out months or years of mistakes and poor habit forming. And I've, I've experienced that personally when, you know, my squat was terrible for years and then I got a coach and in one day, you know, if, if he helped me fix things, um, let's, so, uh, one question I have is you work exclusively with runners and endurance athletes. No, not, not, okay. not specifically. I mean, sprinters, yes, but I mean, I've handled athletes across the board from okay. NFL players to soccer players, um, to martial artists. Uh, so mine is more of kind of the over what I like to, what I like to see is one, I know, and I believe that sprinters are an overall package of an athlete, right? You can take them and pretty much because of their base and what they've done through power and strength and explosiveness and, and movement, you can take them and plant them in any other sport. All they would have to do is learn the modalities of that sport. Um, and by so, modality, you mean the skills of that sport, basically? The skills yeah. of that sport, whether it be soccer, you know, be, becoming more pliable and, and uh, versatile in their dribbling. Football, you know, is obviously being able to take a hit and, you know, a lateral and vertical movement. So it's like learning those aspects. But as far as the core basic things of power, strength, explosiveness, that translates to pretty much every sport that's needed um, in some way, shape or form. Um so it not only runners, but I've done a lot of corrective exercise things, um, strength and conditioning, uh, and then also work through the chain of rehab and stuff too. So, you okay. know, it's, it's, uh, overall, overall aspects, but I would say my expertise from my practical knowledge is probably through the modalities of running and, and, and sprinting and explosiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good to, good to know um, to put it in context, and then also as we talk about periodization, what what exactly we're talking about because we could get very narrow and say, you know, periodization for uh, a, a powerlifting meet or periodization for an athlete overall. But even there's general principles. So, would you agree that, for example, you talk about strength, power, endurance, all of these attributes? Is strength the foundation? Is strength? I don't want to say the most important, but is it the foundation of all of these? Um. It depends on what type of strength we're talking about, right? Are okay, we talking right. about are we talking about like power strength or brute strength? Are we talking about uh, production of force strength? Yeah, yeah, production of force strength. I would I would say yes across the board is being able to utilize how much force we're applying in order to use the strength that we build in the gym in real in real life situations, right? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the times. You know, you do have power lifters, but those uh, even power lifters, I know, you know, I've had, you know, several friends that were very prolific in powerlifting, and you can take those guys and put them on the track and they'll be able to run pretty damn well mm-hmm. uh, if they just learn the mechanics a little bit better of, yeah. you know, cycling and, and force production in that. So I think it's utilizing the things that we, it's capabilities of being able to utilize strength in functional ways. So it's like functional power strength. I think that's kind of like what people are seeking right now in overall health wise and Mm -hmm. trying to be functional in life. Right. But strong functional and they get the misconception of I'm going to be in the gym and I'm going to be this house and I'm going to turn into, you know, this big (laughs) bodybuilder. And it's like, you don't have, you don't have the the DNA to do that, and it's going to take years and years and years and years to even you know build up that type of density. You know, but absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And even even when I've worked a few with a few nutrition clients who are endurance athletes, um, the question always came up of, you know, uh, the focus is always on the running and and very little put into the strength. And hey, I need to lose lose weight so I'm faster. And, and then I, the question I have is, well, why don't we just spend a little time getting stronger? Wouldn't that make a massive improvement? Because to me, it's I think in terms of math, right? You know, strength to to weight ratio, isn't it easier mm-hmm. 
to make yourself a lot stronger than to make yourself a lot lighter. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think, um, for me in particular, it, you know, it's in the space of, you know, track and field sprinters, it's always, you know, it is a strength and it switches from the frame to power light frame powerful, but you have to build that power early in the season mm -hmm. and then switch gears and worry about having a light frame because you've already built that base and that internal engine of things. So, uh, I, I do agree that yes, we need the internal engine before we go out and start trying to hit the gas on anything. Um, but, uh, and I also think that, you know, that, that strength piece is super important for healing situations and strengthening mm -hmm other elements around ligaments and joints and um, um, just overall body and bone density, uh, yep. which a lot of people lose because they don't like to lift and they're afraid of lifting because of the, you know, like we said, you know, because of the, you know, the, the misconceptions around it. Yeah. You're speaking my language, Stephen. <laughs> um, Cause even in the context of people just wanting to get fit and lose weight, oftentimes the conversation is, well, you can't, you can't reveal muscle. You can't get lean if it's, if the muscle's not there, if the strength and the muscle aren't there. And by the way, being stronger is going to improve all these other issues you may be having. Um, so it kind of translates to all of these areas. What about, um, periodization schemes? So again, I think in terms of lifting of things like simple linear progression to undulating and block, you know, these non-traditional types of periodization schemes for lifting. Do you have those kinds of models in, in the world we're talking about here? Yeah. Um, as far as the schemes and stuff, I mean, and, and again, you know, it, it really depends on the subject. So, um, I'm pulling from my own pages of mm -hmm. personal aspects because we don't have a subject right now, but, uh, you know, for us, um, it is heavy volume, Like right, right now I'm in the gym twice a week and then on the, on the track, the other, uh, probably four days out of the week. So mm -hmm. it's a, a six day, um, model right now. And, you know, we're really focusing on so some of the movements and the scheme aspects or you know we work on our own we work off of our own body weight right so um whatever you know let's say our um for our squats and things like that it'll be you know starting maybe like 55 percent of our body weight and then we're working our way up that you know building up those areas building up the areas that are most beneficial to us and mm -hmm. moving horizontally down the track, mm -hmm. um, not vertically. So a lot of our posterior chain is viable to us and then, uh, important to us. So hamstrings, hips, hip flexors, things like that. Um, lower extremities, our ankles and our Achilles and, you know, foot strength, getting them as hard as possible. But, um, the, uh, schemes that we're working on is, you know, roughly around a four to six week space. Um, that fifth week is a test week and then the sixth week is kind of a taper down week where we're not doing any weights and we're on the track and we'll kind of try to do a race model of, um, okay. to kind of get our body okay. in that. When you say um, test week, test, test, testing your lifts or testing your, your skill both. based on the strength. Well, yeah. Yeah. We're, okay. we're testing both. So we'll do okay. test at the beginning of the week, like on a Monday. And then come back on a Thursday or Friday um, with light flush sessions in the in the middle of the week, and come back and run, I don't know, maybe like a split four hundred or you know a, or a hot three hundred, and just push to see where our base is at of all the strength that we build up and the modalities that we built up in there, and like you know all of the different drills and things that we're incorporating. So it's pretty technical on the back end, and and my coaches are overseas right now so we converse on an app and all of the athletes are on that so they actually write out mm -hmm. our programs and we go through that and then we can converse in there if we have any questions and they track things like our heart rate and uh, i wear an aura ring to oh, yeah, me too. Cool. Track sleep yeah so um try to get pretty accurate on the numbers and you know burning calories on a daily basis to know what i have to put back in but i mean Again, it's, it's, 
it's really subject to subject matter and it it uh, is but i'm so curious i'm such a nerd about this stuff and like it's my podcast so i like to ask whatever i want and so i don't know and i don't know if the listeners you know tune me out sometimes but that's just (laughs) like what i like so um i I like to dig into that just a little you you said percentage of your body weight but if, if somebody's a lot stronger than another athlete aren't they are they using a higher starting percentage of their body weight or how does that work um no not at the beginning at the beginning okay. because you know we're all i think at the beginning we're all coming in and with a clean slate and mm-hmm. because we're coming off of rest period so we're not trying to push it but then as as that goes forward the body weight aspect um gets interchanged with kind of one rep max um oh, percentages uh, yeah percentages oh. and things like that so right. we start interchanging plugs and putting them in so then we start to work our way so then if it's like one rep max at 55 percent, 75 percent, 80 percent um i don't think we ever really go a hundred percent so you never uh, test the one rm it's like an estimated yeah. yeah yeah it's estimated but the only time that we'll test is on that fifth week you know, oh, okay, we'll, so that's what I was wondering. You test the one or yeah, there. yeah. It. We'll test it there and just kind of get a big push in there, and only on of our our big movements, our big complex movements. You know, whether you know it be full squat or quarter squat. Usually, quarter squats are are more beneficial for sprinters. You know, we're just focusing on kind of that push and explosion out of the blocks, so they're more beneficial for us um, on the back end and things like. Um, hex bar deadlift um and then uh max uh vert max and just you know being able to push off the ground so you know sports specific things in my space and then you know um, and then for other athletes depending on their stuff so like some of the athletes that i've done their combines for for the nfl obviously it's you know geared towards Sure. What press pressing and other there? things, right. yeah. Bench press, 40, you know, standing long, you know, stretching and stuff like that. But even in that, we I really pick out the spaces in which I feel we pick out the top three because you know that's where they'll gain the most points in and they'll gain the most knowledge, uh, the most kind of ahead of the curve pushing if they can be good in three areas of that test. So it's usually like the 40, the bench and um, a vert max. My name is Tony. I'm a strength lifter in my 40s. Thank you to Phil and his Wits and Weights community for helping me learn more about nutrition and how to implement better ideas into my strength training. Phil has a, a very, very good understanding of macros and chemical compounds and hormones and all that. And he's continuously learning. And that's what I like about Phil. He's got a great sense of humor. We'll go back and forth. He's very relaxed, very easy to talk to. Uh, one of the greatest things about Phil, in my view, is that he practices what he preaches. He also works out with barbells. He trains heavy, not as heavy as me, but he trains heavy, he lifts. So he knows programs, he knows uh, different variations. So if you talk with him about uh, getting in better shape, or eating better, He's probably going to give you some good advice, and I would strongly recommend you uh, talk with him and uh, help you out. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. See some of those guys pounding out the two twenty fives for you know forty yeah. reps or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What? Um, so another question came to mind about the lifts itself. You mentioned like quarter squats. So now I'm interested in what kind of lifts are really effective for sprinters, and then also how a sprinter sprinters training would compare to like a marathon runners training. Mm. Um, you know, I, and, and just as a side tangent, there was just a study that came out comparing half squats and full squats mm-hmm. for, uh, which, which muscles had the most, not, not activation, right. Cause sometimes that can be, be misleading, but actual development. And, you know, some things were obvious, like full squats work the glutes more, but like half squats work the quads more. So it's interesting. You mentioned that what are some of the big lifts for like an average lifestyle person listening who wants to be a better and faster sprinter? Um, so I would, if you're, I mean, if they're not competing and they're just looking to kind of like run flat fast or in any other space, one for us, it's all posterior chain, you know, quads are great. Um, but if you look at science and if you look at some of the past results of, 
some of the best sprinters across the board, you know, the guys with very deep and developed hamstrings mm-hmm. are guys that are able to push down the track and get, and get out of the blocks a lot quicker and have more cycle and, and ground impact um, through their stride. So I'm a big believer in developing the posterior chain a lot. So hamstrings, glutes, um, and then anything that'll help pull horizontally out of block. So hip flexors, um, you know, and then the lower extremities of my ankles and, and, uh, calf raises and, and Achilles areas, but then also being able to translate some of that stuff, uh, onto the field. So barefoot running, squatting barefoot, you know, really getting those, those cushions that divide us from feeling what the floor looks Mm -hmm. like in actual pushing and actual producing force. Um, we do a lot of that and I take a lot of that stuff oh, out. But, like, do you yeah. squat shoes or not? I don't, I use, uh, I do okay. have them. I do have them, but I, I rather squat in my socks and barefoot. Got it. Got it. Yeah. You know, I just feel like, I feel like I get more of, I can feel the chain. I can feel my, uh, the way I'm pushing and if I'm pushing flat through the, uh, the flat part of the foot and utilizing every chain up the back or every muscle throughout the chain up the back or there, or if I'm shifting, I can feel my base a lot better when I'm, when I'm flat. Makes sense. Yep. So, um, so for, so something like hamstrings, right. For me, mm-hmm. it comes to mind would be like RDLs or good mornings or, um, yeah. I mean, bodybuilding movements like a leg curl or maybe, you know, unilateral movements like step ups or reverse lunges or something. What, what would you say are the like top two or three for the average person to, um, to work on? Without a doubt. Um, definitely single leg RDLs. Single leg great. RDLs. Okay. Um, I'm a huge lover and believer of, um, Nordic hamstrings. Oh yeah. Uh, Nordics are like, um, a necessity for any of that type of program. Um, not only for building out density and strength in hamstrings, but also helping out with rehab of, you know, pre kind of rehab of things, you know, and it stretches out the hamstrings and the, the insertions um, on the top of the hamstring. So you keep them nice and long because when you're doing a lot of hamstring work, especially hamstring curls and stuff like that, a hamstring gets a lot of bunching up, so to say, in those areas. Yep. So it helps to keep them long and flexible. Um, so hold like, on on that movement. How do you do, how do you like to do them? Like the bar on the rack or a special machine? Yeah, no, I have, I usually do them <clears> with a <throat> bar on the rack or if I can have somebody hold my, uh, my, my ankles and give me that extra pressure, but I usually do them on the bar on the rack. Um, <laughs> but also having a, um, I'm a big believer in, in also having a variable squat program. So, you know, one week quarter squats twice a week, one week full squats twice a week. And I think that helps out with the lack of adaptation, but Mm -hmm. it helps out with, you know, mobility and helping the body to understand, you know, the depths of squatting um, and able to produce more force at different levels. And what, what squat is this low bar, high bar? Some front yeah. squats, what are they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I do I do front squats, quarter squats, and full squats. So front squats and so it'll be full uh front squats will be in my program pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. And then the other switching variable will be either quarter squats or full squats. So one of those will interchange every other week. Okay. Uh, are you doing them high high bar or low bar? Oh no, I'm doing low bar. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. No, people listening, you know, these are good good ideas. The Nordic the Nordic camp, the Nordic um curl is, is uh underrated, you know. I, I maybe not underrated, just not as well known, right? And it's it's cool that you mentioned that. Um so how do we how do we avoid fatigue and overtraining? That's a big thing in in my mm-hmm. world, especially I work with a lot of older folks and that's, <laughs> and I'm an older, getting to be an older folk. And I, I know, you know, your body gets a little more beat up as you, as mm-hmm. you age. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, one is understanding recovery and knowing that that's a part of your training as well, that it's not just the hour, hour and a half, two hours that you're in the gym, whatever, you know, your program, you know, keeps you in there for, but then understanding that once you go home or whatever you do post that, 
is very important for the days post that to come. And uh, that includes things like rest and recover um, and nutrition and whatever else that you get, can get your hands on, uh, you know, um, and then it becomes body awareness, you know, is knowing your limits. Uh, mm-hmm. as, obviously, as you, as you get older, you're, you know, I put us in a space of like, we're all these batteries, right? And I don't know if you ever have seen like the Energizer batteries or anything that used to have that power strip on the oh, side yeah, yeah. Sure. The thing and tells you how much is left in there. Um, that's kind of like, that's kind of how I dictate what uh, athletes are or, you know, across the board, you know, or general pop is, you know, this is, this is your battery capabilities. This is how much you have in it. And you need to understand is when you're getting to that halfway mark is that, yes, we can do maintenance in that space but also plug back in so that we can kind of hopefully try to stay within the 80 to 85% range throughout the week, instead of having one 85% uh, or two. And by Friday or Saturday, you know, you're tapped out and you have nothing left. Now we need to try to prolong our progression over the course of the week. And that may need to shift in, in what we're doing. We may need to take something out of the program um, during the weeks, or we may t- need to take, uh, add something, um, like a recovery day, like a flush day that is just recharging yourself. But mm-hmm. that really becomes a space of understanding yourself and being able to <clears throat> communicate that with your coach correctly. Sure. Um, and saying like, Hey, you know, and, and the coach needs to be aware too, you know, they sure. need to see that things are dropping off that they're coming in fatigue, they're blowing fumes and, and that their job is to get the most out of their athletes as much as possible and not burn them out because it's their ego trip uh, of, of things. So I think there's a fine line and balance, but the recovery piece is, is a vital, vital, vital part to any, any performance program. For sure. Uh, not pushing too hard. And like you said, by using biofeedback or Mm -hmm. being aware of, of yourself and communicating that, what about, do you program it in as part of periodization? You program in deloads or are you more, I know some people, some coaches prefer to, to do it as they go, right? Like to only use a deload if needed, because you don't want to slow down the progress if the person is perfectly fine. Uh, What's your take on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I usually, I usually implement at least the fourth week as a deload. Okay. Uh, so I'll go three weeks on for, uh, and the fourth week is, uh, um, kind of a deload and a, uh, preparing for another four weeks post that, mm-hmm. um, I think that that's a pretty good model. Now I, th- I believe that, you know, some of the younger athletes can go a little longer, mm-hmm. you know, and, but each athlete is different too. You know, you have to like a lot of the new things will tax people very quickly. So that needs to be taken into account for as well. And sometimes, you know, you just need to implement it during those weeks to prolong past four weeks is like, Hey, you know, you do something like a scheme of two day, Monday, Tuesday on Wednesdays off, and then Thursday, Friday on, and then Saturday, Sunday off. Right. Um, I think those three days off and those four days on will help, prolong things depending on how aggressive the program is as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of kind of windows you can throw in there, sure. but I really like to go three weeks hard. The first two weeks are hard. And then that third week is kind of a build up week for that fourth week where that fourth week could be, you know, maybe one hard session you know, and then they right. come back. Keep the intensity high with the volume low. Right. Yeah. It's cool. So, so you're talking about the, uh, generally a fixed, deload programmed in maybe if you're younger you can go a little bit longer you also mentioned even during the week uh maybe undulating the volume which speaks to me because i just i just switched from a four-day uh kind of west side programming where you're you really don't ever take deloads because the the concept is you're varying the big lifts constantly and you never quite get fatigued on any one lift but it does catch up to you and so i moved to now a heavy light medium so the middle of the week is a much lighter day than the other two it kind of gives you that recovery um, so it's pretty cool. I, I, you know, people listening should, should take all that to heart so that they can be in it for the long game. Uh, what about nutrition? Um, 
things like I'm always fascinated with concepts like carb loading because I know the science keeps seems to keep changing. There have been all these complicated schemes about carb loading and it it seems the science is like, no, it's pretty simple. Just like ramp it up and then eat a ton of carbs for the event. But what? tell me about that. Yeah, uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Nutrition space, everybody's got, you know, one, this is a really, really touchy space for everybody because it's so, it's so flooded with all yep. of these gurus of, Hey, do this diet, do that diet. And there's all these, you know, plethora of diets out there. You know, first and foremost, before you jump on any diet, one, diets are interchangeable. And I think they have their place and their space at particular times, um, depending on what your training needs are and how, how high the volume is, right? I think a lot of the space in which diets are, and you say, you talk about carb loading, well, what what period of training are you in? Like, so if, if I'm talking about carb loading and, you know, perhaps it's my race season um, and I have a race early later in the week, maybe some extra carbs to a midpoint in the week would be great if I'm racing on like a Friday, Saturday, but then I need to taper that off, right? Because I don't want to go into a race heavy and feeling water retention and all <clears> that stuff, stuff and stuff. having a yeah. spillover. Yeah. And having, you know, <laughs> all those GI problems. You know? So, so one, I would highly recommend one is getting at the beginning of the season or the beginning of your program is getting a blood test, getting a panel done, mm-hmm. understanding what blood type you are, And then trying to coincide your eating with what blood type you are. So, you know, which is really not a lot of people go that route. It is a little more in, you know, integral of, uh, you know, the inner workings of things, but understanding what type of blood you are and understanding how your insides work and what is most, um, most your body will consume the best in performance wise. Cause you know, like, right. So everybody understands like if you're giving the same diet to somebody else and you're eating, let's say a bunch of carbs and you feel sluggish, you're not, you're not producing and your body isn't metabolizing. All right. Well, obviously something in there isn't working mm-hmm. for your yep. system or your DNA nutrition. Uh, so, you know, sitting down with nutrition, I'm not a nutritionist. So I don't even, you know, I have nutritionists for me uh, and the the spaces of doing blood work first is really, has really helped me out a lot. You know, I'm a meat eater. I need meat. I need the B vitamins on the back end. I cannot do vegetarian or plant-based. I do have mm-hmm. plant-based shakes that I do in the morning because I feel like they absorb well for me in the morning. But as far as recovery aspects of things, B vitamins like Buffalo burgers and bison burgers, those really help me to keep the inflammation down in my body Mm -hmm. uh, from that space. And then, you know, high protein like eggs and chicken and fish and stuff like that. So and optimal um, nutrition, whey protein, right? (laughs) Plant protein. That's what I use. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you so, do the plant protein. Okay. Yeah, I do the plant protein oh, with cool. them. But then I also do, they do have little RTDs that uh, I keep in my bag for post training that are whey. So yeah. those are really eat. Those are really easy to, for me to throw in. Um, but, you know, it's really, right. that's, that's again, too, is understanding your, your particular type of DNA and the way and what diet is going to coincide with your training, but also your metabolism as best as possible. Because in a lot of those spaces is like, you know, if you're eating the wrong things, it's going to slow your, your metabolism down. Um, and then you're going to gain, and then you're, then you're going to be pointing the finger at everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. First of all, you're making me hungry. It's almost dinner time here and bison burgers are (laughs) making me me hungry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what, I mean, the general principle, you know, people are, people are always going to disagree on specific diets and I'm a nutrition coach. I'm not a nutritionist, but I'm a nutrition Mm -hmm. coach. And for me, it's all about flexibility because I want the client to have something that works for them and and that responds well. There's a guy um, I'm friends with and I was kind of working with him on the side and I said, man, you're you're really getting a lot of fat and not nearly enough carbs and you're doing all this lifting. And he's like, all right, let's, let's try more carbs. He's like, I just cannot live on that many carbs. I can't eat them. I'm sluggish. I don't feel good. Mm Let me go back to high fat. He did, and he was fine. And it's like everybody is different. Um, yeah. There's no one size fits all. So that, that's good. I was just really curious about carb loading specifically. 
because um, what is it? You know, Alan Aragon, he writes the flexible dieting stuff. Oh, yes, um, yes. He like summarized the evidence on this just a few months ago on the carb loading. And I was kind of blown away by how many, uh, how many grams of carbs that you possibly could eat as an athlete, you know, and kind of reduce the protein going into an event. And I was just curious, mm. but like you said, it yeah, for me, yeah. for me, I really like to keep my, my high calories and my carbs. And so, so I'm roughly taking in uh, about 3,400 calories a day, right? Mm -hmm. Well, which is, you know, pretty high. And, but my particular frame of the way I post my days is I'll keep my, my high carbs and everything is when I'm going to utilize them, right? Is, is pre-workout in the morning and then post-workout. And then I'll have one third, one third meal kind of midday. And then as the day goes on, I taper off and I, I don't have any carbs and I'll do like salad and fish and things that will absorb quicker. And then I try to cut off my eating no later than seven, you know, to just get my body into a fast a bit and, uh, and, you know, to promote growth hormone through the body and stuff like that when I'm sleeping so I can get that deep sleep. But that's what works for me. And that's where I feel the lightest. Mm -hmm. And yep. that's where I feel like I'm gaining the most. Um, I mean, could I eat all day? Sure. I could eat all day. I mean, <laughs> I can go through probably two pizzas by myself. So. I hear you, man. I hear you. <laughs> it's funny because I'm, I'm right around 3,500 calories myself, but I'm at the very end of a six month building phase and I'm sick of it. <laughs> I actually want to be on a diet. You know? yeah. like it's yeah. funny. And people hear that, uh, but, uh, you know, the body fights itself, you know, it wants to get back to some sort of balance. Um, right. And the flexibility yeah. piece is, is super important. Like you said, you know, is, is one, you know, it's a flexible balance. Like, you know, yes, there's a number there and yes, you need to know how much output you have in order to bring back the input in on a daily basis. Um, but that number gets people really, kind of blown out of the water. You know, when you right. say 35, 34 hundred calories, like, Oh no, I'm going to get so fat. Well, you need to work your way up to it. Like, it's not like, <laughs> oh, Hey, sure. go out tomorrow and have 3,400 yeah. calories when you've only been eating 15, 1600 calories. Exactly. Yeah. Your body has to adapt up to that for sure. Right. Um, all right. I do want to ask one mindset question, then a couple wrap up if that's all right. Um, sure. so, you know, you overcame all these obstacles by your late twenties and, you used all this to stay focused. So what are your thoughts about hardship in the gym and how it translates, you know, the gym and the track and how it translates to having a, a stronger mind, stronger thoughts, you know, just like uh, attacking life because you went through that physical uh, hardship? Mm. I think um, hardship builds resilience and it also exposes us to figuring out solutions internally um, that'll show up externally. and. What I mean by that a lot of times is one, you have to understand that, you know, there's not going to be a perfect, you're not going to have a, a perfect day ever. And you're not going to have, cons you can have consistency, but even in that consistency, you're, you're still going to have pitfalls. And I think by having those peaks and valleys and in my own life, they've helped me to translate to a lot what I've done in sports and, and, also to let go of things and not to be so emotional on, on the failures and, and really I call it kind of celebrating the, the little wins and being a gold digger. Um, and what I mean by that is just, you know, in every situation there's, there's a silver lining, right? Like there's something that did go well, even if it's the most minuscule piece, something did go well. And you'd be like, hey, you know what? That went well. All of this went terribly, but this went well. And I think that's a that's a shift in which, you know, it's very, it's very hard to come by and it's very hard to focus on because our brain wants to focus on the negative and it wants to pull in all the things that went wrong while we know that there's a win there. And we let that space kind of we let that space just sit to the side and we don't celebrate that enough. Like even, even if we get promotions, even if we get a PR or anything like that, it's, it's in that moment. And it's like, Hey, great. Let's move on to the next one. What, what, how can I run faster? How can I lift heavier? Right? Yep. Like, you don't we don't live in that space uh, enough. And I've really 
kind of tried to focus on that space and, and develop that type of mindset of whatever happened yesterday happened yesterday and I'll leave it there. Now today is a new day. I have a new platform, a new canvas to put forth a better, a better foot and also a better effort. So every time I'm, the, I'm on the track, I'm trying to push the pace, right? I was like, yes, that's great. And I think if we get into that space of how can we push the pace, how can we become better on a daily basis? We force our bodies to put our best foot and our best efforts. Um, and that shows up. I think it shows up. <clears throat> yeah, no, I like that. Celebrating small wins, pushing yourself, reset resetting each day. And even what resonated with me is the idea that if you can celebrate those wins, the next time you struggle with that same thing and recall that you had the win, it can kind of push you through. Like, I mean, it could be something as simple or practical as you're working on a lift and you do it really well one day and the next day it just feels like trash, but you did it well the day before. So you, there's just something has changed and that's okay. Let's, let's find it and fix it and move forward. Right. It's, it's kind of doing a reflection, right? You know, like I could, uh, and that's a huge thing too, is like looking back six months before to where you are now. I'm like, Hey, I remember six months. I couldn't even lift this off the ground. Yeah. And now I'm lifting what two, three plates off the ground. So exactly. like that in a sense is like, wow, you know, I need to take hold of that. You know? and it's probably way more than two and three plates for you, but I right. know uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so, so I like to ask this question of all guests and that is, uh, what one question did you wish I had asked and what's your answer? <laughs> what one <laughs> question do you wish I have asked? Um, uh, I think one of the one questions that you, I wish you would ask is what am I, what am I excited about for the future? Okay. And what are you excited about for the future? <laughs> the things I'm excited about for the future is one transitioning into something new that um, that is going to benefit from the years of experience that I've had. And then also looking forward into, uh, you know, kind of like home living of, uh, I just got engaged. So, um, Congrats. you know, so I'm, I'm looking forward to having the married life and seeing what that's about. And, uh, you know, just having a counterpart to, to walk things out with. Yeah, I personally can vouch for it. It's been a great experience for me. So welcome to the club. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. So last thing, where can listeners learn more about you and your work? Yeah, definitely. I, so I have my new website that's uh, about to be launched. It's uh, www.steviebee.com, S-T-E-V-I-E-Y-B.com. And it's going to be super interactive. Uh, all the things that I have coming up be a schedule there, whether it be events or um, charities that I'm involved with or, you know, races that I have come up and then all of the other things that are developing on the back end of, um, you know, just trying to give as much as I've learned out. Cool. So that's www.steviyb.com. Correct. So a little bit of tricky spelling now, so I want to make, yeah. sure, make sure people know. And I'm going to, of course, include that in the show notes anyway, so people can tap on it. And Stephen, this has been a really cool experience and learning experience for me. It's an area I don't get to talk a lot about, and you're obviously an expert in the area. So I'm grateful you came on the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me, and I look forward to you know what the future holds for you guys. Awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs>